So many researchers, including yourself, do view insulin resistance as a sort of root of causing many different types of chronic mm -hmm. diseases, age-related diseases, obviously type 2 diabetes, yeah. obesity is in there, cardiovascular disease. Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, fatty liver disease, infertility. So so why 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 is that yeah. some, something that people think is the root cause of yeah. so many chronic diseases? And again, you know, why do you, you're talking about insulin resistance being common and certainly like this pre-pre-diabetic state being pretty common. Uh, what do you think the reason for that is? Yeah. Yeah. So the first part of the question, I unapologetically embrace the view that to some degree, that's italicized wording there, to some degree, insulin resistance is a common root cause for most chronic diseases. Uh, so I'm not claiming that it's the singular cause. For example, the connection between insulin resistance and breast and prostate cancers, the two most common cancers in, men and, uh, in women and men, respectively. I'm not saying insulin resistance is the singular contributor, not at all, but it is absolutely a contributor. With regards to Alzheimer's disease, insulin is not probably the singular contributor, but it is one, undeniably. And the same goes for polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, the most common uh, infertility in women or erectile dysfunction in men and fatty liver disease and hypertension. So when I, in fact, this question is the question I asked myself as an academic in, in at my university. When I got tenure, I thought, I looked at the rest at, at my future career and I thought, do I want my career to be defined by the number of peer reviewed papers I publish in science journals? And I thought, no, that's not enough because most people will never read those articles. No one will ever get a direct benefit from them. And I thought, what would be the one message as a biomedical metabolic scientist that I would want to convey to people? And it was this one. It was that to some degree, most of chronic disease can be attributed to one common origin. And so rather than trimming at the branches of this sick tree where we're giving the patient a, a drug for their... Alzheimer's disease, we're giving them a patient for a drug for their hypertension, we're giving them a drug for their infertility. What if all of those were actually just branches coming off of one tree? Let's just cut down the tree. So when we can acknowledge a sort of common soil hypothesis, it starts to simplify the clinical approach. So all of this, in my mind, is a reflection of just how powerful the hormone insulin is. Most individuals only think about insulin as being a hormone that controls blood sugar, which is fantastically unfair. Insulin is one of the few peptide hormones that will literally affect every single cell of the body, from, from brain cells to bone cells, lung cells to liver cells, and every cell in between. There's no exception. Insulin will have an effect at every cell of the body. And the, the particular pathology with insulin resistance is unique because you have some cells that aren't responding very well to insulin, like in the case of erectile dysfunction. Insulin is less capable at producing nitric oxide in the endothelium of the blood vessels, so there's less vasodilation. Less vasodilation means compromised erectile function. So on one hand, you have some cells that suffer because they're not responding, but on the other hand, you have some cells that are overstimulated because insulin resistance is insulin not working the same at all cells of the body and blood insulin levels are higher. So there's too much insulin some cells are responding too much to that insulin. So with polycystic ovary syndrome, for example, that's not a problem of the insulin signal not working well. That's a problem of there being too much insulin stimulating the ovary to inhibit the conversion of testosterone into estrogens, and thus she manifests with polycystic ovaries. So to, to some degree, most chronic diseases can be connected back to insulin resistance. And to me, that has a, a tremendous power. That's a reason to focus on that disorder. So some researchers think that the high insulin is more of a response mm -hmm. to ectopic fat accumulation, yeah. obesity sort of being the underlying cause of the high insulin. Um, I look at the origins of insulin resistance as being one of two one of two origins where you have what I call fast insulin resistance and then slow insulin resistance. And what you're touching on is the slow insulin resistance, which I'll come to in just a second. Within the fast insulin resistance side, there are three what I call primary stimuli that in humans have been confirmed and in rodents and in isolated cell cultures that 
can cause insulin resistance quickly, like within hours. But at the same time, if the stimulus is removed, the insulin resistance is resolved in short order. And that is stress. So elevated stress hormones, whether it's cortisol or epinephrine, adrenaline, will cause acute insulin resistance in humans. As that stimulus goes away, the problem resolves. Next is inflammation. If you increase the levels of inflammatory cytokines in cells or rodents or humans, they will be insulin resistant very quickly. In fact, people wearing CGMs may notice this, that the CGM may reveal that they're starting to get a cold or a flu because they notice that their glucose levels, they're having a much harder time controlling them, even though their habits haven't changed. That's often a sign of inflammation. But even with autoimmune diseases, uh, where you have people where the autoimmune disease will ebb and flow, so too will the insulin resistance. It will track very well with the how active the disease is. And then lastly, of the primary fast causes of insulin resistance is too much insulin itself. So we know in humans, rodents, and cells, I've published my own work on this topic, that too much insulin will result in a resistance to the stimulus. So too much insulin can cause insulin resistance. Now, none of those touch on what you had mentioned, which is the ectopic idea. That idea is very important, be, uh, and there's a lot of nuance to it where we have to define the, the, the fat, first of all. And by that, I mean what of the many of the hundreds of thousands of types of molecules that we call a lipid or a fat within a cell, which are the ones that actually matter to insulin resistance. Some people will think of just triglycerides, which is the main form of storing fat. And yet triglycerides are totally inert metabolically. There was some, a case in point, Brett Goodpasture and David Kelly 30 years ago described this phenomenon of the, the athlete's paradox where they noted that in obesity with type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, if you pull a muscle biopsy, there's really high levels of fat in the muscle, of triglycerides. And they're very insulin resistant. And so some people would say and did at the time, well, high muscle triglycerides causes insulin resistance. And yet, when they did muscle biopsies from very lean, exceptionally insulin sensitive marathon runners, they had just as much fat in their muscle in the form of triglycerides as the obese type 2 diabetics did. And, and again, they were very insulin sensitive. So it couldn't be the fat that was being stored in the muscle. The same could be said of the liver. If the liver has triglycerides, it's not the triglycerides that are causing insulin resistance. So what is it? If there is any lipid that's to blame, it's going to be a lipid called ceramides. And those do not track the same across these, say, these the lean marathon runner and the obese type 2 diabetic. When you start measuring levels of tissue ceramides or its precursor dihydroceramides, there's still some debate as which of the two matters most. I'm very strongly just saying it's one of them. And so I'll just say ceramides as a family. You can in any biological model cause very strong, robust insulin resistance just by increasing the ceramides because ceramides will block the insulin signal. When, cer when insulin binds to its receptor, then you have a series of, of, of phosphorylation events. Ceramides block that very well. It's a very well-defined pathway. And if you can just do one thing and just resolve the ceramides, you correct the insulin signaling. So when it comes to ectopic fat, it's not a matter of how much triglycerides you're storing, but rather what is the entire metabolic milieu to be promoting ceramides in various tissues throughout the body. Interestingly, all of those primary stimuli, the quick insulin resistance, all induce ceramide biosynthesis and accrual. But with the slow insulin resistance, I still think it's appropriate to invoke fat. Um, by, but by that, it's the fat tissue. And I don't want to get ahead of us, but my view is that among, if you look at tissue level insulin resistance, is it starting in the muscle or the liver or the fat? I'm very much an advocate of the fat first focus when it comes to insulin resistance from that slow progressive, it settles in over years and it may take, you know, weeks to months in order to reverse.